Uh, Bismillah. Bismillah. I think it's good. Can everyone hear me? Okay. All right, sisters, can you hear me? All right. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam ala Sayyid al Mursaleen Muhammadin al Amin Amma Bad. فقال عز وجل إنني أنا الله لا إله إلا أنت إنني أنا الله لا إله إلا أنا فاعبدني وأقيم الصلاة لذكري رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب I think what I'm going to talk about today is uh, has very deep deep ramifications and consequences. And I want to talk about human relationships from the very foundation of the human psyche, the very, very, very deep foundation of the human being itself. And all of this really points to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also. The first three words that a human being, even as a little child, uh, the first three concepts, the first three things you can say a child or the first concepts a child begins to recognize uh, as its relationship with the world. And you'll see why the postmodern, the modern world is such a big problem. And that's why I want to talk about this, because when a child recognizes the concept of I, so of the basic three words that is in the very root of our being, one of them is I. And the second one is you. And the third one is it. Okay. Everything in terms of relationship comes from these three ideas that a child forms. In fact, uh, let me mention that a child has no concept of it as such. The concept that a child has is only of me and or I and you. And the reason this is significant uh, it will become clear in just a little bit and its consequences and ramifications will become very clear. Because uh, if you all remember, in the English language, there used to be a word, thou. Do you remember this? Thou. And uh, philosophers like Martin Buber and others, they've uh, expanded upon this. And basically, the difference between you and thou is very, very significant. And that is really the essence of relationships. And that's what we're going to discuss today. But I want you to imagine for a second before we go further on this issue, I want you to imagine a pre-industrial baby is born. It's born in a village and it goes from the mother to the sister, to the grandmother, to the father, to the uncle, to the aunt, and then back to the mother. So it's, it's, rela it's at the very essence of its childhood, at the very beginning of its childhood, its relationship with the world is I and you, okay? It's I and you, I and you, and I and you, and there is no objects in its relationship. By objects, I mean it, okay? The child knows I and you, but it does not, it has no direct relationship at these early years with an it, meaning objects. Now let's compare this baby with a baby born today. A baby born today is born, it's with the mom, it's with the dad, then it's with the computer, then it's with the TV. And the it, the it's, the objects, dominate the life of the baby more than human interactions are part of that baby's life. Is everyone with me? Yes? Okay, 
what is the effect of these its and objects in a baby's life where it is beginning to develop the concepts of I and you, and now there is an it. And most of the things in its life are it. And it is it because you can manipulate it. You can press a button and get what you want. It is uh, a button pressing type of upbringing, you can say. It is the urge to dominate, the urge to control. And so babies are brought up in the modern world. The first things they know how to do is to press buttons. Right? They know how to like start the remote control, start the computer at a very early age. It's actually surprising, maybe sometimes at the age of three or so. Now, seven months, there you go. You know, and uh, you would be surprised at how technology oriented some of these babies are, sometimes more than the parents. So, anyway. Uh, in, in, in child develop, in the baby, in development of the baby, there's a phase where the baby does not know language yet. But, it be, but you know it's about to learn language when the baby begins to point to things. You know, you may have remember a scene where the baby is pointing to something but doesn't know what it is. It doesn't know language yet, but it knows. And this, you can say, it, in the Arabic language, is something called ismul hishawa which everyone knows, it's exactly like that. It's like the pointing of something to something for which there is at that time in the baby's mind, no language. But the baby knows I want this, this is it, okay? Now, how does this affect us? And, and what is deeper about this? Is that when you grow around objects, when you grow around buttons, then what happens is that you superimpose the it onto the you. And you expect the use of your life, which are not complete use, they're just, they're not, they're use, the it becomes you or you becomes it. So mom is a button you press and she gives you your food. And uh, your dad is a button you press and he drives you to school. And everyone is, the you is something you manipulate. You press a button and it does something for you. And so part of the relationship problem that happens in the postmodern world is that uh, we grow up to feel that everyone around us is not a you, but an it. And this is, the loss of where the crisis of adab is happening. Let me further explain. Is everyone with me so far? Okay. <coughs> when human become, beings become an object at a subconscious level, right? Because you've played your PlayStation so much or you've turned on TV so much, you have this expectation that human beings should be like machines. And if they don't act as machines for you, then you get frustrated and irritated. And this, this is why, for example, just as one example in relationships, sometimes we want to text a person rather than talk to a person because we want to keep the person at a distance, at a distance of it, right? You wanna keep them at the distance of being able to manipulate and not deal to, Text is easier because we're, we're more comfortable dealing with machines than we are dealing with human beings. Dealing with human beings is very hard. And so we deal with human, begin to deal with people as objects. So here's another change that has occurred between the pre-industrial revolution and the post-industrial revolution that's extremely significant. And that is that when we say mom, or when we say dad, or when we say child, we don't mean mom in the same way mom was meant in the pre-industrial age. When we say, oh, he's a teacher, we don't mean to say the word teacher 
as it was in the pre-industrial age. How was it meant in the pre-industrial age? Uh, it was, mom was not a function, meaning she is the one who does my laundry and she does my dishes and she makes my food. When we say mom today at a deep down level, what is it that if you have objectified your mom, then, then she has become a function in your life and you identify her as that function in your life, which is part of that manipulation process because she's doing something for you that you want. And what happens as a result, and why is this different from pre-industrial age is because in the pre-industrial age, people were identified not primarily by their function, but they were identified by their status in your life. Like this is my wife, not because of what she does for me, but because this is her status. This is my mother, not because of the function she performs, but she is, this is her status. This is my husband, this is my wife. This, uh, the, er, we, if we're at, talk about the workplace, right? It's very common for people that'll be in the workplace and if somebody's computer breaks down, they'll say, oh, the computer guy will be here. You probably all heard of this at some point or the IT guy will come. How do we identify? We have objectified human beings. We have made them into objects that do a function for us. And so therefore we're never completely saying you as in you to the whole of the person. We're always talking about a specific aspect of that person. And so relationships get diminished when let's say husband and wife or brother and sister or, uh, or any relationship where the relationship is functional at a subconscious level, where the relationship is a relationship of objects at the subconscious level, because you grew up with objects all your life and now human beings are just an extension of that. Being an object. And so that day is not very far where you'll find a robot to be your best friend over human beings because you're so used to, and we can even imagine this at this point, that a robot's not going to bark back at you and not be tough on you. It's not going to criticize you. And so we can't take criticism because we live in a world of buttons. I press the button and do what I want. Tell him you're angry. And so what has happened as a, and, and, and let's extend this now uh, further, uh, just, just an extension to other areas of life so you can see how pervasive and deep this can become. Knowledge, when knowledge becomes it, meaning it is something that you can use to manipulate to the function of knowledge is, the purpose of knowledge is not to grow as a human being, but something that you use to, let's say, make money. Right? So the knowledge becomes an it and not something that you use in your relationship with the world around you. Uh, let me give you another example. The environment, the tree is an it. But think of the pre-industrial man who sees the tree, the roots of the tree, the plants, the beauty of the tree, the fruits coming out of it. He cannot just see the tree as an it now. It, it takes animation it takes life it takes on a life of its own he sees it as if it is living right and so the world we live in today the environment is in it right it's it, 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 the clouds the sun the moon it's all it it's all to be studied and manipulated study the sun so you can build solar energy right study the moon so you can do uh, whatever you want with that so the objectification of human beings is one of the biggest problems of relationship in the modern times. And it starts at a very, very young age where kids learn, wait, there is a, I can press a button and make things happen. And that's what we begin to ex expect from human beings that she should listen to me like I, or he should listen to me or he should accept what I'm saying or she should accept what I'm saying like a press of a button. And so now let's extend this to finally, we have human beings, the environment, and then Allah. And then if Allah becomes objectified, which we have done in recent years, because we complain, why did God do this, right? It didn't do what I wanted. I can't manipulate God. Uh, I, uh, and, and so 
you do dua to Allah, Allah give me this, give me a, you know, this and this and this. And if Allah doesn't give it to you, you're upset. Right. Because you're, it's not a relationship. It's a I and it relationship. So the question then is, what was an I and you relationship? What was I and you relationship? Okay. And to kind of explain that, uh, I'll give you this, uh, you can say metaphor or story um, that let's say there is a dad and uh, he's a doctor, okay? And uh, the dad says uh, to the uh, son that, uh, son, when you grow up, what will you be? And the son says, dad, when I grow up, I'm gonna be a painter. And the dad could get angry because if he sees his son as an it, then he wants to carve and to be able to manipulate and press some buttons on his child to make him into what he wants, he'll be angry. Why do you wanna be a painter, right? You have to be like a doctor, like me. And so this is where the problem of, uh, you can say relationships happens. Uh, it is, when the son said, I want to be a painter, did he sin? No, right? What happened was, is that the, the father that is not objectifying his the son the father that's not objectifying his son doesn't see his son as an it but rather as a you but even further than that thou which i'll explain in, in a second the difference between the two but the father who sees his son as you right i and you he sees his son as a human being that has his or her own feelings, her own dignity, her own preferences, her own opinions. And that father who sees that then is able to what? Is able to accept uh, the differences between human beings and the differences between him and his son and him and his wife. But if we're living in, a, in an objectified world, we don't want to see differences. We will ignore differences ignore the person who differs from us and not have a relationship with the person who differs from us, even if it is a child of ours, right? And so it's very, very important to recognize that how we have begun to, you can say, objectify yeah. human beings uh, and, and make them into objects of relationship rather than I just seeing them paper as towels down. human beings. Now, let's bring this towards our Quran and Sunnah of the Prophet There's nothing greater than the words I and you from the perspective of relationship and personality. Uh, I'm gonna There's take nothing the greater back. than the Sorry, words I. Inna you, you, yeah, I'm gonna grab this one you and did not mean right in, out here and in, in, in the, out in the past uh, days did not mean a huh? word like when you say you did okay. not mean this is your it. function with me that he limited view of, that. of what how right. you serve me in my life but rather the word you meant the entirety of you now this is very very important from a perspective of relationships because uh what you when i say you or when allah says you to the prophet but this is water. not a you of the of the modern understanding of the word you. Uh, anybody ever see the movie Avatar? Uh, there's a scene there where one of the uh, tribal people, uh, one of the tribal yeah. people, um, says to another person, "I see you, right? I'm here for you. I'm here completely for you. I'm open to you." You, or rather thou, to be more precise, the idea of thou, you, all of you, meant I'm, oh, I am, I'm interested in all of you, not you as the computer guy, or not you as my mom who performs a function for me in life, or not as dad that is doing some function for me in life, but mom who has a certain, because of her status, not because of her function, and this is very, very important difference between the pre-modern and the postmodern thinking that 
the labels that we used were not labels of function. The labels we used like teacher or the labels that we used like a healer or a doctor, they were not functional. They were status, status in, in terms of uh, how wonderful it is that this person is a teacher or how noble is it that this person is a teacher. Um, so now in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the prophet, you, right? Inna atayna ka. You know, ka in Arabic means like, like something like this, or it means you. Iya ka na'budu. Oh Allah, we worship you. We and you. This is the very basis of relationships. And what has happened is, if your understanding of you has become it, and you're saying to Allah, oh Allah, we worship you, and you've objectified Allah, right? So now you've kind of like distorted that relationship. And so this is what's happening with human beings. We are distorted our relationship because everyone and everything is an it rather than the whole of the human being. And so when we say assalamu alaikum, so if you understand the narration of the Prophet وسلم, when he said, uh, uh, should I not tell you of something that if you do it, you will love each other, which is what? Say assalam alaikum, right? Why? Because you, this you and kum, can also be seen as a plural of respect because it's not ka, it's kum, which is for plural. So it's plural of respect that you're like saying assalam, which we generally translate as peace. Uh, I would like to translate it as becoming complete or becoming whole. Okay? Like qalbun salim doesn't mean a peaceful heart, it means a heart that is. Uh, holistic or complete or has, has been <laughs> completely healed or become completely whole or completely fixed. So Salim uh, is also used in Quran for a baby that is born healthy. In Surah Al-Anam, I believe. So when the Prophet, you say, Assalamu Alaikum, right? You're not looking at the person as an object. You're not looking at the person in terms of function. You're looking at may you be complete or may you have complete peace or may you be fixed uh may you be completely healed may that salam be upon you right so you're engaging with the whole of that person not just as a function you're engaging with that person's uh you can say emotionally intellectually physically uh whatever other ways or or dimensions this person has you're completely interested in that person as a whole rather than just as a function. And so what has happened now, let's bring this back to home in terms of um, our marriage relationships, that when we talk to one another as husband and wife, mostly we're talking to each other in terms of our functions in our life. Like, did you do this? And did you do that? And did you do this? And did you do that? And you didn't do this, and you didn't do that. And these are functions in life. And we have very little time where we have that moment of actual you and I connection. That holistically. And how does that happen? It happens really. There's, there's no way, there's no science behind it. There's, no one's been able to figure out the magic behind it. The how do two people, like if Adam and Hawa were in Jannah, all they saw was each other in a sense, right? Because he's with her and she's with him. There's no one else, right? And even the objects, they're, they're like part of the two in a sense, meaning that what they're eating, the trees, it's, it's all one being and it's all one process, you can say. And they're growing together. And they're not talking. So, so what I'm trying to say is that when we talk to each other only at the level of function, and we lose that. So let me explain what I'm trying to say this way. Two people can have the same conversation. A man and a woman and a man and a woman. Uh, let's say two couples, husband, wife, have the exact same conversation in which they're talking about, let's say, uh, a, a recent news event. A recent news event happened and they're both talking about it. Now, this couple A is talking about, oh, did you hear about that news? And they talk about it for five minutes, but nothing sparks between them. It's just a conversation. 
It was just a conversation. You, and the other couple has respect. the exact same conversation. How many? But there is a moment of that what is something in between the two happens. Yeah. Something sparks. Something creates a connection where the two became like one just for that moment, even. All right. Okay. For, why does that happen? Down here. There's no science. All right. No one knows why when two people are talking about the same thing, the same huh? event, the same circumstances, yeah, or and yet again. two people, these two people, they are completed by it. They feel closer by it. And the other two do not feel closer by it. It just was a mundane routine conversation, right? Why does that? So this is where, this is where, very importantly, where Tawfiq comes in. Where Tawfiq comes in. That every interaction of the Prophet with his wife was a moment, a, like a moment of something big, right? There was Tawfiq there. There was Fadl there. It wasn't just mundane. One reason everything becomes mundane is because we treat each other in terms of our function. Everybody is just an it. Like the machine forms a function, a human being performs a function. You have to get beyond that. But even getting beyond that is not necessarily in our control. Just because I don't want to objectify my wife in our relationship. She's my wife, she cooks for me, she does this. Just because I want that doesn't make that go away, right? Being aware of it will help trying to look for moments that are special you can say that create and nurture the twos uh together is something that obviously people would look for but it's not something that's in someone's control and this is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran that allah causes the hearts to come together right allah is muqallib. and this is the part the psychologists don't get this they're confused and baffled that why does something work so well in scenario A and scenario B is exactly the same, but it doesn't work. And you can't explain that because there's something that obviously they don't understand that there is something in between. Uh, Make Islam of what is between. So this interaction, one aspect is not objectifying it. But then further than that, even if you see the person as a whole human being and want to do that, it's not up to us to allow us to get to that point of like a relationship where there is a moment of uh, a, a true you, like all of you, right? Like, assalamu alaikum. And so that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what when we say the dua of the Quran about family relationships, which is Rabbana Hablana min Azwajina, oh Allah, give us the gift. It's a gift, it's a moment, it's created and gifted to you. That that moment, Rabbana Hablana min Azwajina wa and our children, coolness of our eyes. Because you can't create that coolness of eyes by objectifying them because you're just trying to manipulate them and trying to make them into something that they're not. And so they become coolness of your eyes when there's a true authentic relationship. But on top of that, there is a certain grace, a certain tawfiq that's needed that they really become like the coolness of your eyes. And so, Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata ayun imama and oh Allah make this is the man now make me or make us the, uh, the mother uh, the imam of the people who have taqwa meaning who has taqwa the family members because this dua is not becoming imam of the people no this is the fa family this is the imam of the family okay so becoming like the people like make me the imam of people who have taqwa okay so what we have to do in relationships, what something the, uh, you can say, the world doesn't see this miss, missing piece of puzzle, uh, is that you have to do dua to Allah to give you tawfiq, that when you're interacting with your spouses, and this, this, this is why this dua of the Quran is very important. Everyone should say this dua every day especially in these times. It's very important dua. So 
because this 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 will inshallah give tawfiq for those moments of where it's not just two people talking but it becomes something more than a conversation it's something that allows something to be nurtured that is that wasn't there before a connection that wasn't there before. okay so now uh, how much time do i have Okay, so let me just, uh, before I go further, uh, okay, let me mention this and then I'll come and ask you guys some questions to see that if we're all on the same page. Carl Rogers, who was a famous uh, psychologist, one of the uh, main uh, founders in the United States of, of a certain school of thought within the field of psychology, uh, he also said basically this, what is, the counselor doing right in islam everyone's a counselor every human being's a counselor in the sense that when you study carl roger what is the function of the of the counselor the function of the counselor is is that it's the the meeting of the psyche the two people coming together meeting of the psyche not a functional relationship see when the the counselor meets the person He's open to whatever they want to talk about. That's healing, right? That the meeting of two people's psyche is healing. This is like actually an idiom, or you can say a, a, a rule within the field of counseling. That it is, not, it is not your advice or your strategies or your tips that always gives the healing. Sometimes it's just the meeting of minds, the meeting of two psyches, the meeting of two people that... I and you, I'm completely open to you and you respect me and I respect you. This is the therapeutic relationship. I respect you, you respect. And, 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 the, and the, 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 the client could be saying everything that therapists could disagree with. But there's that respect that's maintained, that openness that's maintained, where there's an environment of safety, as-salam alaykum, right? That environment, that that environment where you can speak your mind. You don't feel like you're on eggshells all the time. And so that relationship that is almost uh, like every relationship in Islam at some level, nasiha, deen is nasiha. Every relationship should be a therapeutic relationship. Every relationship should be a meeting of minds where people get healed because there's no healing without, if there's only I, then there's no healing. And if there's no you without an I, and there's no I without a you, healing can only take place when it's the meeting of two. This is exactly what, for example, in, within our Islamic tradition, you see Rumi and his teacher, right? At Tabrezi, right? This is the meeting of the two. Uh, you have many examples of this in history, including you know, the prophet and Abu Bakr, for example, or so, so it is the meeting of two psyches together that creates healing. But for that psyche to feel healing, it cannot be a, a meeting of the minds where everyone is talking at the it level, you know, where they're talking at the functional level. Did you do this? And did you do that? Did you throw out the garbage? That's not two people seeing each other the you in each other right there's no you and i in that it's just you and it did you do it right did you do that right it and that is the same basically and so it's very important that you, we look for moments in our life every day with every child with every spouse with every that at least there's one moment where you have made a real connection that's not a connection of functionality and you do dua to Allah that Allah make a spark in this relationship. I'm going to talk to my daughter. My daughter never listens to me. I'm going to talk to my son. He never listens to me. Well, that thing in between you and that child, that moment that it, if, it is, if it is number one, not a conversation of function. Oh, can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? Or why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do that? No. 
but rather a meeting of minds on an honest level, the way a counselor and a client do. What if they implement right? it? Like that, hey, what do you want to talk about? Hey, what do you think about this? Right. Or what, however, the conversation starts, but it is therapeutic. For That's what therapy is. Therapy is when two people come together and discuss things openly. And just the fact that you're able to disagree with someone openly, for example, is a healing process. Somebody might say, I'll give just an, a practical example. Somebody might say the most un-Islamic thing, but just because now that they've expressed it is a form of healing. I've seen people like, uh, I've seen people question God and just talking about, like I saw like uh, one day, uh, somebody came to my sheikh and said, you know, I have, a, this is about 20, 25 years ago. Somebody came to my sheikh and said to him, you know, there's this man, he's my brother, he's an atheist, he doesn't believe in God. Uh, can you like meet him and convince him? So my, my, my sheikh said, fine, you know, let's have breakfast together and we'll see what happens. And so Darsab went and had breakfast with him. And now he's having breakfast with him. He did not mention God or proofs of God the whole time. He just was interested in him uh, because he's a famous person. He's interested in this man. He, oh, how are you? Oh, okay, what do you do? Oh, you're, oh, I'm also a doctor. You're also a doctor. Okay, oh, wow, you know. And that meeting of the mind transformed something between them that his doubts went away just by that healing conversation. Had the Sheikh brought up arguments, it would have not been a healing of minds. Because you don't argue with the client the first time you meet them, right? And so th that is what was happening between the Prophet and the people. The Prophet never forced anyone to become Muslim. He just presented, this is my message. And you think about it. That's healing, right? That, oh, this person can look beyond my function or my status in, in my tribe or or, or look across my weaknesses, or I can say the most insane things to this person, and he's just open to it all, and comes back and honors me, gives me honor and dignity, doesn't look at the function in my life. And so here I want to open the doors for maybe perhaps a broader discussion with the audience that we have here, that uh, what are your reflections and thoughts on what I said so far. And then this is a very, very, very deep conversation. It goes very, very deep. And I don't know if, if you guys like this conversation and want to take it forward, then in next class, we can take this even deeper and deeper because this I and you and uh, the meeting of, the, of, of I and you, a complete meeting of the psyches, uh, you know, this is very profound. This is what happened between Allah and Musa, when Allah said, Innani and Allah, I, I am Allah, I am Allah, right? And so this I and you uh, is a very um, fundamental, uh, and it is here where the corruption of the modern society is happening. It's over here at this level that human beings have become corrupted. A, looking at each other only in terms of function, and B, not being present at the moment for the tawfiq to come to actually develop something that is in between the two, even though it cannot be clearly identified, it's this or that, but something happens, some grace, some tawfiq that builds that connection. But if there is a connection, for example, a client and a counselor, if there is a connection, then healing happens, not because necessarily of what the client or the counselor is saying, or not necessarily because of what the client is saying, but because of being able to just being fully yourself, fully exposing yourself, fully talking about yourself, talking about your problems, being having an honest relationship, that is where healing happens. Okay, so let me start with uh, the sisters because they were here longer, and then I'll start with the brothers that just came in. So which sister would like to begin? Just reflections on what I said. Uh, 
What's that noise? Part of this is a very this is a very good point you've mentioned, and I will say here you're not grown up till you can talk to your dad as a man, and that is the goal of the father. You're not completely grown up until you can talk to your dad as a man. So. You know, that moment, that it's a very good point. That moment where you disagree with your dad and you're able to express that disagreement with your dad with respect, that is when you have now grown up. Yeah, it takes many years. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So many people are married, right? And uh, they're living with their mom and dad, for example, and the wife is uncomfortable because of whatever the routine maybe the dad has or the routine th that is in the house. Maybe the wife is uncomfortable and the husband doesn't know how to bring it up to the father. He, so he, can't, he's, he, he wants to respect his dad, right? But he's lost in that function rather than the, you can say, um, rather than the opus, openness of the relationship and the greatness of that relationship. Hmm. Okay, any other thoughts? That is because the meeting of the minds of the husband and the wife may not have happened. I mean, there can be many reasons, and I don't want to uh, speculate. I mean, the husband and the wife are a team against the children, okay? If they're not a team against, it's like tag team. Husband and wife are a tag team against the children. It's the will of the parents against the will of the children. And, and it takes a lot of will to outdo the will of the children. But the children will learn to respect that. And once, once you are able to show that you are kindly able to kindly and lovingly and mercifully able to, as husband and wife, tag team each other and stick your to your ground, and you will outdo the stubbornness of your child, that is when you will begin to win. Any other reflections on my conversation today about the, 
the child, the I and the you and the objectifying functional relationships versus are the sister okay so do you have any comments? There's a lot of dynamics and a lot of areas here. So yeah. if I were just to think like this is like this is like partially like technology, the iPad and I'd be like, well, living in two ways, like, how do you put the zoom back in the model? But then my question arose from that is, hasn't this kind of been happening before technology, like children trying to find out like, how much they can get from their parents? And I, I know technology does play, play a big uh, part in kids having like ADD, not being able to focus on human relationships. So it's kind of like that to learn it. It's not too late. Uh, there's always a way back home to Kitwak, to human nature. And uh, we just need to become aware of it. And we need to see if the relationship, and this is really, I guess, really what I was trying to drive home is that everyone would ask themselves, do I see everyone as an it in my life? Do I see everyone as an it in my life? Or do I see everyone as you in my life? Do I see everyone as a function that they perform in my life? Or do I see them as complete human beings, right? Am I there for them the way a counselor is there, you know, for his client? Of course, he's paid, but he's there for his client fully and completely, right? And open to whatever thoughts and feelings that they have. Am I there completely at, like the way a counselor would be for my spouse, for my children? Un uh, and, and here's one of the things that I want to point out is that when you look at people as an it, right, what's the first thing that will happen is you will make a judgment about them based upon their past. So when somebody is an it, how do you know that if I'm treating someone as an it or not? And that one of the ways you'll know is that as soon as they come into your sphere of, uh, into your bubble, and they're talking to you, you're immediately judging them. Oh, you didn't wear the right clothes, or what are you doing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You're immediately judging them rather than giving them an open space of expression, you can say. When you are open to them, you're at the moment, meaning you're, you're not judging them based upon the past, you're at, in the moment with them. And that's the difference. When you see other human beings in your life, you judge them in ba based upon, okay, is this person good for me, bad for me? It, not in the moral sense, but in a functional sense, uh, in a materialistic sense, maybe. But you're judging them rather than being in the moment and open to them. That's the essential difference. That when I see another human being, so, so have I made other human beings into objects of it? That's the question I want everyone to ask uh, themselves. Because the problem uh, is that if I have made everyone an object in my life, and I think in today's time and age, it's inevitable, it's just a matter of what degree. We, th that, just that people don't exist anymore, uh, in the, like in the pre-industrial pre, pre age, where you're completely concerned about the welfare or the complete welfare of the other, even over yourself. And you have good feelings and, and you want, you want uh, good towards the other more than yourself and you, you see them more important than you even. That time doesn't exist in a sense. It's very, very hard to do what Imam Shafi said that he said, whenever I met someone, I always considered them better. Than me. That's really being present in the moment with someone, right? That's really being, that, that means that when he met someone, he wasn't judging them. And when he met somebody, he was in the moment with them, right? He, somehow everyone contributed to his own growth, right? And so, but we live in a time where we have very limited time and we're in haste and we don't have time to sit and be open and chat and so on and so forth. And so, how, to what degree have I made everyone an it in my life? And to what degree have you made everyone an object in your life? And 
being aware of that and how we can reverse the process internally. This is what I'm saying is extremely important if especially Islam is to move forward as time goes by. So that was reflections on what you said. Assalamualaikum. Right, to manipulate will. it, to use it, to discard it, to ignore it. But, but it, yes, and, and in the olden days, even livestock, people had a relationship with their horse. And, their, and they felt something for that. And they, they felt that they felt uh, what it is feeling, right? And uh, whether it was true or not is besides the point, but they felt a certain relationship, a certain relationship with the environment. The environment became alive, when, uh, which it is. But in, in the postmodern times, the environment is, is in it. It is to be manipulated and changed and, ch and you are to dominate. When something it becomes an it, whether it's in a relationship or an object, the uh, the object then becomes to how do I dominate that, right? It can be kind words, it can be smooth talking, it can be uh, a lot of uh, good act, a lot of theoretical, a lot of uh, you can say uh, a kind of like a theatrical, theatrical. Uh, it, it's it's just acting but it's not real and so how do we change our relationship from it to a real relationship where it's beyond an object where i don't have to dominate it but compromise with it exactly you're you're engaged with it right you're engaged with it and you're open to it and you're and it does not feel any sort of sense of threat by your existence like we say assalamu alaikum yes and and that's how but by, by the way to take this at the international in in the international level the same thing right the islamic thesis or the islamic ethos is not that of dominating like we have found in the west okay the, because everything became an it countries became an it People became an it, and armies became an it, and, and uh, oil became an it. Everything became it. And so it, once everything is objectified, then everything is less than you, and it needs to be manipulated if you have the power, right? And in the Islamic the ethos, that would be unacceptable. That wouldn't come into the picture only because uh, in Islam, the the worldview, the way we see the world, that the dignity of every human being is at, at, the, at the birth level, very different from how the West sees it currently, at least. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah, so just some comments on that. Actually, some people have written on that very question. So there are a few opinions. I'll share them with you and then, you know, we don't have to have a definite answer. But one opinion is that uh, some people have talked about the increase of tools over time in terms of history. And this is the typical Western model of history, which is that uh, human inventions increased over time, right? This is the typical 
standard, which we can agree or disagree, I'm not going into that. But as tools increase, so let's say the child, but let's say if the first tool was fire, for example, at what age did the child learn to make the fire? At what age was he dealing with the it? Or let's say the human beings invented the wheel. At what age does he deal with this it? The, the problem is exasperated, not because, the, uh, I mean, the problem has always existed, but the problem is exasperated because, the, the, because of the level of intensity and the, the level of time and energy and the access to technology and tools for little children at such a young age. That is where the psyche is being developed and it really takes people from being, uh, from being you and then people also become it. Yeah. Yeah, and every human being becomes an it in your life. Because that is where the flip happens. It's at that young age where you're so used to everything in the press of a button. And then, you know, this is why many parents are uh, complaining. Children are not listening to us because you play a certain role in their life, like the press of a button, and that's it. And, and that's what the Prophet said, when the mother will give birth to her master that the child will treat the parent like an object, like a slave. And when will that happen? Then the prophet continues. When you see the Bedouins who are, who ha, who, who, uh, who are, uh, they have the sheep and they have no shoes, then they will be making tall buildings because now it's the world of objects. Right, and, and so, I mean, there's a lot to this and, and your point is essentially correct. So that was one point of view that tools have increased over time and they've reached a peak now uh, where we're more comfortable with tools than human beings or technology than human beings. One thought, one thought that popped for me as well too is like, not only that, it was like this whole celebrity age, everybody's you know, like a certain status. And like I thought about it like this, like I don't like talking to people on the phone that much because I don't like to deal with the resistance and the conflict and the speeding. You could just text me, you know what I mean? And I thought about that and I'm like, that's convenient. But then I'm also thinking about it like, you know, the more people become like you, uh, Instagram celebrities. Celebrities aren't allowed to just mingle with the, with the regulars. You know what I'm saying? So we get this it's part of the ego, the whole. I, I noticed that. I don't like to go to conflict and, uh, you know, the struggle with human past. So, so here's, here's the question, right? Really, and this is a very, very important question on the same question, which is that how did people pre modern times deal with so much conflict that we just try to avoid now? Verbal conflict that we don't. You know, you had like whole families living together and there was a lot of conflict, but they lived together. How did that happen? Right? So they were in a state of conflict, but yet they were not in a state of conflict because they were okay with other people disagreeing with them. What has happened to our ethics is where we are impatient with the person who has a different opinion or disagrees with us, right? So if we have a large house and dad says, we don't have enough money for milk for the next two weeks, everyone's able to tolerate that. Now, if you say, well, kids, no milk for the next two weeks, you're gonna have chaos even with a small family. So, that's actually a very good point and this is where i and thou right? thou i i or you and uh, thou thou is a you of respect and in the urdu language for example there is there's tu which means you and ap which means you but ap is a is a you of respect and when people are looked at in terms of their functionality rather than 
their like mother, right? My mother. Mother now is a function. Before mother was a status. It was part of the hierarchy, right? And so I and you, you are no longer part of the hierarchy. You are something I manipulate. It's the, it's the antithesis of having a hierarchy. It's, it's that, you know, your dad, you perform a certain function in my life. But before, when somebody said that was my dad, that meant that he was great. Or that's my mom. That meant she's great. She's part of a hierarchy, right? And the great person would be the one who sees everyone above him in that hierarchy. Everyone's better. Than, everyone's greater than me. But now it's the opposite. It's been inverted, right? That how can everyone and everything serve me? So in that uh, relationship of you and I, or I and thou, is that our mental view of the world or is it I and it? And so this is in that, in that conversation, the hierarchy is very important because when it is an it, it's not part of a hierarchy. But when it is a you, it is, it, is, it is part of a hierarchy. It's something that you respect enough to be open to it and something that you see as great. Yes? So give us some, what are some, some techniques we can practice to break away from it? Because we need something to be able to escape that. You know what I mean? Like, act differently. Like, what are some... So this is why I opened the conversation so that the application of this uh, you guys can help me. So, yeah. So how, you know, well, obviously one part is that uh, to be aware of this, right? And, uh, and then whatever relationships we have, our ch children, our wife, we look for moments where we're actually engaging fully uh, the way a counselor would. You know, how are you? But you're not just saying it. You're saying it the way a counselor would say it. Right. Yes, at the moment, being present. Yes. Eye contact is actually, there are a lot of studies on eye contact. That's actually very, very powerful. And, and yes. Uh, and so eye contact, uh, in fact, uh, they say if you lose love, you know how they talk about being in love versus love, being, you know, like when you really love intensely versus, they say, one of the ways to get back in love is to look into each other's eyes oh for the God. husband and the wife, right? And so when people are newly married, they're always looking at each other's eyes, right? And what's interesting is I found many narrations of the prophet about the prophet and Aisha looking into each other's eyes. Yeah. Yes. So if if you have made all human beings into an it, you will make Allah into an it. And your relationship with God is, what have you done for me? And why did you take this away from me? That's right. That is what I'm trying to say. I'm saying that you cannot have, you cannot be like, oh, I love Allah and my relationship with Allah is so open. I accept everything he does and I accept my qadr and everything is maktub and I have rida with Allah. And yet with human beings, you see them as it. That's not going to happen. Right? If you see human beings as it, or let me say, there must be a direct ratio or a direct proportion of how much you see people as an it and that's how much you see Allah as an it. And that it is an obstacle to an actual, authentic, genuine relationship. Yeah. 
That's very good. So th there's a whole conversation that we can have on that too. But I want to go back to what Dr. Mehta was saying. And it's a very important question. But remember, every map lies. No map that a person will give you tells you the whole truth. It's partial truth. But this is also a partial truth, but it's a very important piece of the truth, which is that it essentially comes down to, part of it comes down to this. That if I ask you to make a peach into an apple, what will you say? You can't. Yet we expect change from human beings. Meaning everyone has, how well, are you to deal with the relationship when you do. don't accept people for who they are? What do I mean by that? I'm not talking at the moral. If someone talks too much and it's irritating to you, why is it not easier just to accept that that's who they are? Right? If someone uh, is, has a certain habit you don't like, why not just accept that rather than try to change it and try to manipulate it? Right? So accept, accepting your husband for... Yeah, but so if, if I expect this chair to be a swirling chair, it's not going to work. Our relationship is going to be very bad. So this is what I'm trying to say is that outside the issues of morality and being and ethics, right? You have to accept the person to get along with them as they are and you can't do them if you see them as an it you can only do that if you see them as you then you see oh this person is a peach and he cannot become a banana and the dad's trying to convince the boy you better become a doctor when he is not of that aptitude and so accepting your wife accepting your husband accepting your children for who they are Right now, if you look at the Prophet, وسلم, every companion was different, and he never said to any companion, Why don't you become like this? Why don't, why don't you become more like Bilal? Why don't you become more like Abu Bakr? Why don't you become more like Omar? He never did that. He, I mean, he left everybody to be, he accepted them for who they were, right? And so, part of it is you have to draw the line or know what is the line between I have to accept them for who they are versus where you have expectations and need them to change. We spend so much time in our relationships changing a peach into an apple. That too might happen. Challenge, I think, is uh, that it takes a lot more effort. Assalamu alaikum. So, as you pointed out, we would address people for their actual person, which is a unique thing that humans have. Yeah, he didn't bring up their histories. He was just in the present moment, dealing with it as it is now, regardless of what happened in the past. I mean, he was. Subhanallah. Yeah. Oh, that's very, that's very easy. Is that what somebody's asking online? Oh, okay. It's some, it's able to what? Okay, if somebody can read to me, but why you have to lower your gaze to the women? I suppose this is a brother asking this question. So I'll answer very directly and very simply. He, male sexuality is directly linked to his eyes. That's why the magazines, the dirty magazines, they sell. Okay. 
Okay. Huh? Leid auf, Mann! Those that are online can, if they have questions, they can write it on, I guess, the chat room. Otherwise, I'm done for today's presentation. What I want to know is, do you want an extension of this same conversation to continue, or should we go on to another subject next time? Please. The, the sound of the children, please. So, oh, harsh. yeah, we can have a class on that, but I don't think the different fields of psychology don't really offer perfect solutions for that. But we can have a conversation on that. Right. What I got from it is try to take your time and yeah, practicing being in the moment with someone practicing. and not judging them and just being open to them huh. as a counselor. Because every Muslim is nasir. Every Muslim is huh. someone who gives sincere advice. And so just being there and listening listening and doing Imam Ghazali's solution as everyone here knows because you listen to Sheikh Tamer, Imam Ghazali's solution to everything is doing the exact opposite, right? We've talked about this. And so, uh, you know, if you feel or if you fear or if you have idea you treat everybody as an it, then try to go to the extreme of the other side from time to time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think there was an acronym for that. Yeah, there is. Ford There's an acronym. Ford. It's, it was, is it Ford or I forget what it, it is. is. Basically, it's like family, uh, uh, recreation. So 
when you get through those four, you find out 90% of somebody. Hmm. Or if, if you want to okay. know about somebody, you just stop and listen because they will talk to you about what's fresh on their mind. So I used to uh, do bodybuilding you know, like 10 years ago. And uh, a friend brought to my attention, he said, Aaron, within the first 15 minutes of somebody meeting you, they will know that you bench 400 pounds. That's a fact. <laughs> number one, your chest walks in the room before you do. Mm. And number two, it's just what's on your, it's what you talk about. Because mm. you dedicate so many hours a day to it. So it's what you end up talking about. And if you listen to the person, you'll see what, what's on their mind. And then you can start to approach them as that you, instead of that it of, oh, this is a, this is a car salesman. I need to get the best deal out of it. You know, instead of, why is this guy a car salesman? Did, did he want to be a car salesman or did he fall into it? Or is he on tough times? Is he have a family he's got to support? Is he have another job on the side? What would he do if he did have, once you start asking those questions and picking their brain, they, they grow fond of, and that's when that, like, that magical thing happens where that connection starts sparking where it's like, why do I like this person? And a lot of it right now, it's very, people are very vulnerable to that because they don't have that. So when they get a little glimpse of it, they really like to hook, line, and sink it. Right. Yes. Oh my God. Somebody, somebody <laughs> cares about me, you know? And that is why <coughs> one of the companions of the prophet said, so that each one of us thought that we were his best friend. Uh-huh. Right. Each, because that can only happen when you feel the person was completely present completely listening to me and understood what I was trying to say. Right. And so the prophet was an, of course, an expert at that. And, and what you said is a very good example as a manager, when you start talking to them about their life and their issues or what they like or dislike or their hobbies, right. When you start talking to them about these things, it really is like you bring out the human side right and so now the relationship is not just employer employee and in 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 that sense i'll just make the statement that the master and slave relationship not the way it was in the u.s but the way it had been in the ottoman empire the muslim civilization the master slave relationship was still a relationship of i and you right whereas the employer employee relationship is i and it If it doesn't serve me, I will fire it. You can't get rid of a slave you don't like, right? If the slave does the whole day things you don't want, you can't fire it. You still have to feed it and still have to clothe it, still have to. So anyway, the master-apprentice relationship was, a, 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 even though there was a hierarchy, was a relationship of love. And so I think that's the example you gave of being a manager is a very good example uh, of of the... in terms of technique of how to uh, bring out more of that closeness and personality. So that means that husbands and wives have to talk outside the functionalities that they see of each other as husband and wife, right? Talk about other subjects that are beyond the immediate scope of their functions. And that's the thing that something has to spark to create those conversations, those moments. Um, yeah. Yes. Then you compromise and negotiate. Oh, this is a very long question. I'm going to have to have a whole hour to discuss. Yes. <laughs> the solution to that is you don't treat them as it and you try to get them into a conversation beyond your routine to something bigger right and so you accept them for who they are 
and talk to them about not what is the problem between you and them, but something like you have to spark something that is outside that relationship. I mean, I know I'm giving short answers, but. <laughs> yeah, I do have to go to Jamie. Okay, then I should go. Okay, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. Yes. So we can maybe pray here and then go there. Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone. Thank you for coming. I hope that was helpful. Inshallah.